Good morning, everyone. This is Jeffy Kennedy, author of Fantasy Romance and Romantic Fantasy. Who even knows? I'm here with my first cup of coffee. Ah, oh. ah, oh. oh, the angels sing. Uh, today is Monday, February 14th. Happy Valentine's Day to all of you. Um, I've never been a huge fan of Valentine's Day. Uh, it's it used to be painful when I was single. I think it's one of those holidays that like if you are in a relationship you really don't care that much. It's like eh, and or every day is Valentine's Day depending on how sickening you want to be. Uh, <laughs> but and if you're single and don't want to be it's painful. I think even if you're single and you do want to be it's painful because if you're happily single the other 364 days of the year and then Valentine's Day rolls around and all of a sudden you feel like all of your choices are called into question and yes I've been that soldier. <laughs> so it's um, apparently spring here. It doesn't necessarily feel like spring although the days are getting longer nights are growing more warmer. Oh, sorry um, this is how my brain works. I, it's chock full of like song lyrics and especially from Broadway musicals. At any rate the sun is warmer. The days aren't that much warmer but the birds the birds have decided it's spring. So now I'm looking out my window at the portal and there are a pair of finches that are trying to make sort of this top spiral of wisteria vine up in the corner of the portal work for a nest. And <laughs> I just don't think it's going to happen. I don't know. They're very determined. I have to say too this is like totally off topic but that's what you guys have to uh, are used to here at first cup of coffee. I got this suet because the bush tits have been coming through. Bush tits are adorable. They're these tiny little birds and they come through in the flock and they cheat madly. You mostly know they're there because you hear that dee 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 dee. and they'll just swarm the suet and so they've been I've been seeing them around so I grabbed a suet for them at the grocery store you know like one of those ones with chock full of mealworms mmm and brought home and I could not find our little suet feeder bracket. This is like part of my life I don't like to talk about is the fact that here we are back to Valentine's Day. Every day is Valentine's Day. Been with David for 31 years. Love him. Best partner in the world in so many ways. The man cannot organize shit to save his life. Uh, <laughs> and when we moved into this house there's this workbench in the corner of the garage and there's this one really long side and then a shorter side and so I said oh hey why don't you take the whole long side for your tools and I'll take the short side for my gardening bench. Okay so David is one of these people. Is it is it a man thing? It might be a man thing. So when he sees an empty space he doesn't think oh that is the empty space where X thing normally lives or there's that empty space that Jeffy keeps open on her gardening bench so that she can actually do gardening bench things. No, he thinks there's an empty space where I can set my shit down. <laughs> I know that we have a suet feeder bracket. It is buried somewhere. I I eventually he kicked me out of my gardening bench you guys. He kicked me out and I I, I went without protest. He he had like this brilliant plan brilliant plan. He's like oh if you moved your gardening supplies out back then I'll have room to organize the rest of my tools. Reader he did not organize his tools. I don't care. I took all my I was like fine. I took everything that could stand the elements and I even have a little bin out there to put things in. There's a couple things that stay inside like wedged in the corner uh, and now the whole thing's a disaster. He always thinks that if he can get my stuff out of the way that that will like magically solve his problems. 
hope springs eternal, right? Anyway, that's a digression that I did not mean to get into. But anyway, suet feeder could not find the bracket thingy. So I like wedged it into the wisteria vine where it's pinned against the post. And, and it was great. And the bush tits came and they were merry and all was well. And then yesterday I noticed the suet's gone. Stolen. I think coyotes stole it. Little fuckers. So I, I bought, I went on Amazon and bought one that's supposed to come tomorrow. So I know, I know you all care. That's my uh, saga of the suet feeder. Um, birds are wanting a nest. It's actually nice to hear their spring songs. Um, Valentine's Day, halfway through February. <sighs> okay, so I did work all weekend. I may be slightly manic and punchy. I don't actually, I feel good. I'm, I'm feeling fine. I made it almost all the way through my revision. I did slow down Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I did not get through many, as many pages, but I was also adding a lot of words. Um, so it, it felt like good work. It didn't feel like bad, slow work, but yeah, I definitely slowed down. Um, Friday, 35 pages, Saturday, 30 pages, yesterday, 27 pages. So I've made it through 333 pages of 344 written so far. I am a little shy of 93,000 words, like 11 pages left to revise, right? Um, I'm guessing at the 13,000 words, for those of you who are not familiar, I figured that by where the beats are, so like where my act one, word count is, where my midpoint word count is, at two climax at this point. I think I've made it through. Actually, I think I've written all the way enough to be um, act three climax. Let's see, because I figure act three climax. No, not quite. So act two climax, I was figuring was going to hit somewhere around 92,500 words. Oh, I'm sorry, scene seven words at 92,500 words. Transcript is going to hate all these numbers. The transcript does not handle numbers well. Um, and then Act 3 Climax will be at about 95,000 words. And then partly because this is third book in a trilogy and this is the way it's working out, those are dramatic beats, but I'm going to have a couple of chapters of resolution of things that need to be um, handled. They're not necessarily big dramatic beats, but they're really important for the story in the world and for setting up the next book. I'm definitely going to be writing at least one more book in this series, probably a lot, which I know makes you guys happy. So yay. Who knows when I have to figure out that. Storm Princess comes after this. So um, I had a point. What was my point? Oh, so yeah, I worked Saturday, Sunday, doing all that revising, adding a bunch of words. Um, yeah. So, you know, like last week, even though I was totally revising the whole time, I, um, I wrote almost 7,000 words last week, which is a lot if I'm just revising. So I'm clearly adding, deepening. And yesterday I added another 1,500. So making it. So yeah, I'm, I'm guessing I'm going to end up somewhere around 105,000 words. So yeah, I've got like 13,000 words to write and polish this week. Can she do it? Probably, probably. I'm at least I'm feeling energized. So that's a good thing. And I know more or less what it will be about. All good things. Um, so I actually have notes. Look at this. I have all kinds of notes, things that I wanted to mention to you guys. Um, currently reading Juliet Marillier's Daughter of the Forest. Jeffy, you haven't ever read Juliet Marillier's Daughter of the Forest before? Why no, you guys, I have not. <laughs> why? I don't know. She was like never on my radar. I don't know why. And then when The Mark of the Tala came out, I got a um, hair flip, starred Library Journal Review, and they compared it to Juliet Merlier. And so I bought Daughter of the Forest then, 
which I think came out in like 2000 and was, you know, and I've tried it. I know I've tried it a couple times over the years and totally bounced. It's very interesting how my attention has changed. I don't know if it's pandemic. I've, I've bounced off Thorn before too. And this time just dove right in. So what is it? I don't know. Uh, but anyway, I, you know, sort of been looking for my next thing to read and let's see, what had I just finished reading? I think I was talking to you guys about it. Oh, I read a, a couple of things. Um, oh, I finished reading abandoned in death. That was fun. And then I read a couple of things that I didn't love, so I won't mention them. Although I liked them enough to keep reading for what it's worth. I read this one story that I heard people talk and talk and talk about it a while back. And now I haven't heard much of it since. And it was just very meh. It was a fairy tale retelling. I must be on a kick. And, uh, because, um, daughter of the forest is also a fairy tale retelling, right? Of, um, is it, what was it? The Swan Prince, something like that. You guys will tell me. Uh, I just can't think of it right now. I, I have brain. I'm like reasonably articulate, but then other things it's like, no, I have no brain. I was in a SIFWA meeting on Saturday and I was trying to think of a word and I couldn't come up with. I was like, you guys, I, oh, I screwed up someone's name. <laughs> it's so funny because it's Nathan Lucas. I know Nathan Lucas's name and it's there on the zoom only had it backwards. So it was Lucas Nathan, which I guess was a relic of his day job. And, and I called him Luke and I'm like, why the fuck am I calling him Luke? And I, I felt so bad and, and they were all laughing at me. I'm like, really, you guys, it's just words. Anyway, um, I'm enjoying daughter of the forest. I will talk about it more later. There's a thing I really want to talk about today, absent of, um, digressions. So there were some conversations I saw lately about, um, Kindle unlimited and just to remind for those of you who don't recall or don't know Kindle unlimited is Amazon's subscription reading service. So you pay your 1495 a month and you can read an unlimited number of books that are enrolled in Kindle unlimited. It's also called KDP select from the author publishing side. Um, and it was very interesting listening to these gals talking about sort of their struggles with getting readership, getting page reads. Uh, someone was complaining that they'd gotten negative royalties and you get negative royalties because Amazon lets people return your books and they were upset saying, you know, that it's not fair that readers shouldn't be allowed to return books that they've read, which, you know, it, it is a problem. And I get occasionally get my books returned and there is a pattern where you could see people um, working their way through your series. I saw someone else commenting on this where you could see them, see a book gets bought returned next book in the series gets bought returned next book in the series gets bought and returned. And there are readers who will freely admit that they do this, that they, um, buy and return books because they don't want to have to pay for them. And yeah, it sucks that they're allowed to do this, but if you are taking advantage of the Kindle unlimited ecosystem, this is partly what you get. Um, you know, everybody loves Kindle unlimited when it's paying big bucks for page reads, but it does teach readers that they can get books for free and you know, sucks, but that's, there it is. Um, one thing that I think people have to keep in mind, authors have to keep in mind is that these people who do this are a minority the ones who do the read, return, read, return. Uh, there, there are some, they freely confess to doing it. They're, they're freeloaders. They're just always going to be that way. Most of my readers buy my books, even the people who get the arcs of the books, then go back and buy the book. They are awesome. They support authors. These people that won't pay for books, they're going to pirate it or figure something out. They're just, um, you're never going to convert them. They're, they're just sort of like the, um, the crowd of humanity. Sorry, but you guys are. It's a shitty thing to do. Um, you're basically saying that you don't 
value what the author did. That's the next step in this. Okay, so there's the, the unrepentant people who just won't pay for books ever because they're shits. Then there are the people who do buy the book and feel like it wasn't worth it and they're going to return it. So some of these um, authors were saying that they would never ever do that, that they would never return a book. But one of the things that the Kindle Unlimited ecosystem also promotes is this minimum viable product idea that a lot of people because a lot of authors uh, because it is a free thing that they they don't go for the same quality because you know that that's that's the big marketing push right is that you say oh you can read this book for free why not well if somebody buys the book and reads it and thinks that it's not worth it that they shouldn't you know that it's um that they're disappointed in the book then yeah then they can return it and that's part of our society right you buy something and you think it's not worthwhile you don't want to keep it you return it some of that's writing a book that people want to keep and reread um it's not easy I know it's not easy but that's the thing so then the other thing that I wanted to talk about and I'm kind of running out of time because I digress too much but I think I can get through it is some of these gals were talking about how in Kindle Unlimited you come up with a different pseudonym for each subgenre and it's I was thinking about this because basically what they're doing is they're wanting to communicate this is the trope that you want to read for free that is in fashion or whatever in Kindle Unlimited and I mean yeah it's a it's a marketing approach you know you're taking they're taking advantage of the Amazon algorithm but I wanted to give some history for this because in publishing um, and in reading and writing that the the brand of the book or story has always been associated with the author's name right readers follow authors so when you talk to readers about who do they like to read and and this is sort of like how it was before Kindle Unlimited right you know that people would always talk about oh you know I love Grace Draven's books a little shout out for my bestie I love Grace Draven's books I'll write I'll read anything Grace Draven writes uh, we all have our favorite authors that way our bookshelves are full of authors that we love to read their book we love their voice we love the kind of story they tell right now there was a huge push for a long time especially in like the early 2010s maybe before that I mean it's been true all along where the publishers were really trying to establish themselves as the brand um, Harlequin is one of the few who was successful at this where you would read you would pick up a Harlequin category romance because it would promise you a particular kind of story experience and readers almost didn't care who the author was they would after a while follow certain authors but it was like oh you know I love Harlequin Blaze I, I you know and they were numbered and you would you could get them mailed to you you know get your Harlequin Blaze every single month that that's a particular kind of branding right but for the most part publishers have not been successful as establishing themselves as the brand of the book because readers are never going to be oh I love Harper Voyager books I'm going to read every Harper Voyager book I can get my hands on right just doesn't happen they're going to follow authors readers associate stories with authors except now with this Kindle Unlimited working of the algorithm and I don't know if Amazon wanted to do this on purpose I kind of think they didn't but basically you're you're getting people to follow the al algorithm you're getting them to follow the subgenre trope um, you know like monster romance monster romance is great but you're getting all of these readers who want to read a monster romance and you have all of these authors using pseudonyms for their monster romance books and then they may have I mean there are people who have like five six seven pseudonyms for all of these subgenres that they write so do you see what's happening 
is these authors are no longer creating a loyal readership to their brand, to their name. Um, you as the author, that is the biggest, most critical piece of brand marketing that you have. Um, and it's, it's being set aside to pursue the algorithm, to try to get the reads in the category. Um, and that's, that was what all of these little notes were about because it, it occurred to me, it just occurred to me. And I feel like I almost want to write like an article on this because I think it's, it's not good for authors. You guys, you are, it's like authors are voluntarily giving into this, handing over the branding to a publisher because in many ways, Kindle unlimited is now the publisher, right? So now these, this branding is happening in these little subcategories and it no longer matters who the author is because everyone wants to just jump in and take advantage of whatever hot trend it is that, and I, and I chimed in and said, you know, this is, I, I write as myself for everything. I know I've been hinting at that. Maybe I'm going to do this new, new project that would be under a pseudonym. We'll see because it would be a real departure for me so far that hasn't happened. Um, but even then it would probably still be Jeffy Kennedy writing as because for better or worse, I have a strong brand associated with my name and I'm so glad that I have that. And someone was even saying to me, um, that they were, I, I got this great cover and I'm going long. Sorry. I got this great cover for, um, prisoner of the crown that's been translated into Czech and the cover for it is, Oh my God, orgasmically gorgeous. Um, which is so great because the U S cover for it sucks donkey balls. I'm sorry. It does. I hate it. Um, and it's better than the first one they tried to give me, <laughs> but so I was just sharing this with some of the gals saying, you know, here's my beautiful cover and you know, here's what the U S one was. And the one of the gals commented, she said, well, you know, that U S cover, um, I would pick it up because your name is on the cover, but Otherwise I would not. Whereas the check cover, I would pick it up, not caring who the author is. And that's what we want, right? We want to get those new readers and win them to our author brand with the story inside. But that was part of what kicked off this thinking. And I'll put the check cover in the show notes or, you know, on the photo on the podcast. But, um, I'm, I'm really interested to see how the transcript handles check. What do you want to bet? It's C H E C K. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm excited about that cover. Uh, keep in mind that you want those readers who say I would buy that book because your name is on the cover and because they feel that loyalty to you, they will buy your book and they won't return it because they're loyal to you and they want to keep your books. Lots of thoughts for this Monday. Wish me luck on getting this uh, 13,000 words and change plus revised this week. Uh, it's going to be interesting. I think I can do it. I think I can. I think I can. I will um, talk to you all tomorrow. You all take care. Bye-bye.